Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. What is true, uh, and I'm, I'm actually being serious here, is, is that uh, there are, uh, there's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. We can't explain uh, how they moved, their trajectory. Uh, they, they did not have um, an easily explainable pattern. And so, you know, I, th I think that we're, uh, people still take seriously trying to investigate and figure out what that is. Uh, but I have nothing to report to you today. Um, The first voice you heard was that of President Ronald Reagan addressing the UN General Assembly in 1987, followed by President Barack Obama answering a question posed about the existence of aliens on The Late Show with James Corden. So how will the world react to that potential threat? Is disclosure really in hand? Well, I think it may well be closer than it ever has been, and for seemingly good reasons, but I'm also going to take those reasons apart over the course of this episode as I share my thoughts about the subject. And hopefully they make you think as well. Now, this won't be an all-encompassing discussion about UFOs or aliens, and the ideas presented in this episode might not even be related. In fact, it's sort of a couple different possibilities. So absolutely feel free to comment, share, flame, and discuss on YouTube or in the comments at loreandlegends.net. Now, for those of you who followed Lore and Legends for a while, you may recall I briefly had a hand in a now-defunct podcast called Skinwalker Radio that focused on Skinwalker Ranch after a close friend of mine became acquainted with a former guard of Skinwalker Ranch. While the ranch was owned by Robert Bigelow and under the OSAP and ATIP programs. As we dove into the history of the ranch, we talked with a lot of people, from former guards to current employees who appear in the History Channel show The Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch, but it also led us into conversations with some of the eyewitnesses like Gary Voris and Patrick Hughes of things like the 2004 Tic Tac UFO event. But we also had some conversations with people that weren't recorded, and it was those side conversations that really sent us down some serious rabbit holes. One thing we couldn't escape was the idea that there was indeed a major push or struggle for the overall narrative surrounding UFOs, aliens, and the weird. Just recently, on May 13th, 2021, not long before 60 Minutes aired its big UFO episode, author Ezra Klein published an excellently written opinion piece in the New York Times called, Even If You Think Discussing Aliens Is Weird, Hear Me Out, which I will link to along with everything else mentioned in this episode at loreandlegends.net via a link in the episode description. But in this article, one paragraph stood out to me, and will help set the tone for this episode. Quote, the question then would be, who could impose meaning on such an event? Instead of a land grab, it would be a narrative grab. Diana Pasolka, author of American Cosmic, UFOs, Religion, Technology, told me, there would be enormous power and money in shaping the story of humanity itself. If we were to believe that the contact was threatening, military budgets would swell all over the world. A more pacific interpretation might orient humanity toward space travel, or at least interstellar communication. Pasolka says she now believes this narrative grab is happening even now, with the military establishment positioning itself as the arbiter of information over any UFO events. End quote. If you look through the rest of Ezra's article, a few names should stand out to you. They are former Senator Harry Reid, former director of the CIA John Brennan, and former head of the DIA, John Ratcliffe. For those of you who don't know, Harry Reid is the guy who gave Robert Bigelow, his personal friend and donor, the secret contract for the OSAP and ATIP programs that we still know very little about. And if you go looking, you will find a list of items that were worked on under ATIP where the name Hal Putoff and Eric Davis comes up. Hal Putoff being a long-time spook, if you will, famous for his work in lasers, 
and the early days of Scientology, but more so for his involvement with the Army and later CIA psychic spying programs, best described by Project Stargate. Eric Davis was also the resident physicist on the original NIDS team at Skinwalker Ranch in the late 90s and early 2000s. Hal Putoff visited the ranch during this time frame as well. Both of these men have no shortage of talking points and conspiracies surrounding them, and they could at one time both be found in and around Blink-182 guitarist Tom DeLonge's To the Stars Academy of Arts and Sciences, along with former deputy director of the DIA, Christopher Mellon, and the former head-slash-manager of the ATEP program, Louis Elizondo. Another name to look at here is Neil McCasland. There are more names I could mention, and as I mentioned, plenty of other stories to go along with him. But do you see a trend yet? Most all of these men are high-ranking intelligence figures, and most of the incidents they describe all exclusively involve the military. Now, if you're a good conspiracy nut, that should at least be something you stay wary of. But we do ultimately have the input from the Navy crew members and pilots who all claim to have seen something very unusual. So what is it that put so many of these secret world folks in the same basket and in front of cameras and microphones? I don't know, but I do believe they all saw things that are very unusual, and the ones I've personally spoken to all do seem believable, even though there are disparities between some of the accounts. That being said, I do want to point out a couple of things. The Navy does in fact possess the ability to create plasma UFOs, and I'll quote from a Forbes article published May 11, 2020, titled, U.S. Navy Creates Plasma UFOs. Quote, The Navy declined to discuss the project, but the work is described in a 2018 patent, wherein a laser source is mounted on the back of the air vehicle, and wherein the laser source is configured to create a laser-induced plasma, and wherein the laser-induced plasma acts as a decoy for an incoming threat to the air vehicle. The patent goes on to explain that the laser creates a series of mid-air plasma columns, which form a 2D or 3D image by a process of raster scanning, similar to the way old-style cathode ray TV sets display a picture. A single decoy halves the chances of an incoming missile picking the right target, but there is no reason to stop at one. There can be multiple laser systems mounted on the back of the air vehicle, with each laser system generating a ghost image such that there would appear to be multiple air vehicles present. Unlike flares, the LIPF decoy can be created instantly at any desired distance from the aircraft and can be moved around at will. Equally importantly, moves with the aircraft rather than dropping away rapidly like a flare, providing protection for as long as needed. The aircraft carrying the laser projector could also project decoys to cover other targets. The potential applications of this LIP flare decoy can be expanded, such as using a helicopter deploying flares to protect a battleship, or using this method to cover and protect a whole battle group of ships, a military base, or an entire city. End quote. But wait, there's more. The Navy also has something referred to as Project Nemesis, an excellent article published on thedrive.com November 7, 2019, titled the Navy's secretive and revolutionary program to project false fleets from drone swarms. Describes it as an array of drones and electronic warfare equipment that operates both in the air and underwater, and it confuses multiple sensor systems into thinking that they see things that simply aren't there. The Nemesis program started in 2014 and was part of a war game exercise as soon as 2015, not too far removed from the USS Roosevelt UFO incidents. The Drive's article also suggests that the Navy expected Nemesis hardware to be ready by 2018. And if that wasn't enough, the article mentions UAVs launched from submarines as well as unmanned submersible vehicles. But were Navy personnel on duty really fooled by secretive Navy tech in our own backyard? I don't know. My point here is just to stop and think. Consider the famous grainy black and white videos we've all seen. Infrared videos, that is. I'd also say 
especially consider the incidents that happened on the west coast, near the U.S. Navy base at San Clemente Island, which seems to be conveniently in the area of many of these events, including the 2004 Nimitz encounter, and the recently reported USS Kidd incident. Now, the Navy does also have some really weird patents, usually just referred to as the UFO patents, and they describe what could only be called a classic UFO, a power source that could allow a craft to defy gravity. More excellent reporting from thedrive.com, though, suggests these patents never amounted to anything other than a not-so-well-funded R&D exercise. A link is at lorenlegends.net. Navy figures aside, let's get back to all these intel types I mentioned at the beginning. If they knew something was not, in fact, alien tech, why would they lie about it? Well, I don't know. You tell me. Do you trust the CIA and DIA to not lie to your face for political gain? And consider that some of these people may not even know that they're lying if this is the case. Also consider that if Congress is pressured to pursue the issue, the result of that is taxpayer dollars flooding towards whoever has their hand out the fastest. And the military-industrial complex would gladly march you into another Iraq for a few dollars more. To that end, an article published in Newsweek, May 17th, 2021, titled Inside the Military's Secret Undercover Army, points out that our hidden spy force that operates domestically has swelled to some 60,000 members, the largest such force in the world. And they do all the awful things that make us cry foul when they have the name Russia or China attached to them. Think about Edward Snowden, Julian Assange, or literally any other real conspiracy of the past half century, like Project Mockingbird, or the incredibly suspicious mishandling of the Jeffrey Epstein story. Are these really the type of people you trust? I'm not necessarily saying they are all being disingenuous when it comes to UFOs. But what happened to not trusting the government, especially when it's an issue they could grab by the horns, never prove, and use it to do whatever they want? Not at all unlike how the COVID-19 crisis quickly ballooned into the tinderbox for the Great Reset, and the bait-and-switch phrase, Build Back Better, echoed by politicians the world over as an excuse for more government spending and debasing of our national currencies to the detriment of the common man. Consider the following quote from Nobel Prize-winning economist Paul Krugman on CNN's Fareed Zakaria GPS in December 2017. Quote, If we discovered that, you know, space aliens were planning to attack, and we needed a massive buildup to counter the space alien threat, and really inflation and budget deficits took secondary place to that, this slump would be over in 18 months, he said. And then if we discovered, oops, we made a mistake, there aren't any aliens, we'd be better. Pause. There was a Twilight Zone episode like this in which scientists fake an alien threat in order to achieve world peace, Krugman said. Well, this time, we don't need it. We need it in order to get some fiscal stimulus. End quote. What Krugman said here is relevant and is a sort of version of what's called the broken window fallacy. You can read a much, much more in-depth breakdown of that exact issue by following the link over at laurenlegends.net, but the main point here is that many people view catastrophe, or perceived catastrophe, as an opportunity. Krugman was being lighthearted when he made this comment about aliens, but the idea is out in the wild. Now putting all of that together, think about the Reagan quote I used to open the episode. How would the world react to the idea of UFOs buzzing around unchecked? Would the UFOs even need to be real in the sense that they're alien? Or would enough people merely need to believe in it? Would that really be so different from any other crisis in recent history being abused to a political end? In the words of Winston Churchill, and perhaps more memorably in recent times, Obama's former chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, never let a good crisis go to waste. I do want to add one more thing to this topic before we go. Escapism. The tendency to seek, or the practice of seeking, distraction from what normally has to be endured. Alien and UFO stories are unique in this regard. Not that there are no other forms of escapism. I mean, we raised a whole generation on zombie apocalypse movies. 
But aliens and UFOs have a sort of universal appeal, because we all look at the stars, and we can all see how big space is, and we all at one time or another have wondered if humanity is really alone. I think maybe there is a hardwired part of our brain that thinks or is ready to think about this issue, and it isn't entirely detached from the religious parts we have. My point? This topic is uniquely primed to be a story or event that has real consequences, depending on who handles it and how. And as such, regardless of what you believe, be cautious of who it comes from and how it comes. And be especially careful if it comes from the institutions of power, dangled as a carrot in exchange for more power. So what do you think about the modern narratives surrounding UFOs and aliens? Let me know in the comments at YouTube and at LaurenLegends.net. Do me a huge favor while you're at it and drop me a review on Apple Podcasts and share an episode with a friend. If you like Lauren Legends, you can also leave me a tip by clicking the little coffee cup icon at LaurenLegends.net or subscribing to the exclusive supporters-only podcast feed. Well, that's all for this episode. See you next time.